Today I'm invited you to pray and reflect on the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. This is the year of Matthew with a 19th century Russian icon. Remember, icons are not just works of art. They are first and foremost works of prayer. Each Gospel writer has a particular story to tell for a particular specific Christian community. Each Gospel writer, therefore, emphasizes certain theological themes to suit this community. Merging them together into a single story, like we often do at Christmas, risks missing each Gospel's unique perspective, and we today's readers run the risk of missing the Holy Spirit's message to us through the Gospel text. Matthew's community is made up of many Christian Jews in the Diaspora who had to run away after the persecutions in Jerusalem. Matthew therefore recontextualizes and shapes his Gospel to reach such Jewish community. What are the themes in Matthew's Gospel? 1. Jesus is the new Moses, bringing all of humanity to the freedom of the final promised land, God's Kingdom. 2. Jesus is the new Israel, which will include and embrace Jews and Gentiles, all nations, all humanity. 3. Jesus is the Saviour and the Emmanuel, the God with us. Jesus is the founder and the cornerstone of the Church to continue His mission and His ministry here on earth. Only in the Gospel of Matthew, the word Church is spoken from Jesus' lips twice. Jesus shapes and forms His disciples, led by Peter the Rock, the head of the Church, to continue His mission and ministry. Finally, Jesus sends the disciples out to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and to preach His message to all nations, promising them, I'll be with you always, to the end of time. He is going to be the Emmanuel, the God with us, to the end of time. The Gospel of Matthew presents the birth of Christ with a very distinct perspective and introduces the reader to the main themes he will develop throughout his Gospel. But before we look at Matthew's unique perspective, it is important to state that he agrees with Luke on the main elements of the birth of Christ. The areas of agreement with Luke are 1. We have a betrothed couple named Mary and Joseph. 2. Joseph is a descendant from King David. 3. Mary conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit without human intercourse. 4. Jesus' name is determined by angelic revelation. 5. Jesus is born in Bethlehem during the reign of Herod the Great, but only Luke mentioned the stable because there was no room for them at the inn. Finally, Jesus is brought up by Mary and Joseph in Nazareth. The major difference between Matthew and Luke is the role of Joseph in the story. Luke tells the birth of Christ from Mary's perspective. Matthew tells the story from Joseph's perspective. For Matthew, Joseph is the silent, unsung hero of the story. And this is where the icon can help us explore Joseph's role in the Gospel of Matthew. But this icon, it also includes some episodes, legends, taken from the apocryphal proto-gospel of James, as well as a story from Luke. Let us begin with the central theme of the story, the birth of Jesus. As you can see, Mary has given birth to Jesus, but not in a stable, but in a cave, in front of a cave. 
the Virgin and the Child are surrounded by the angels in adoration. In the Eastern tradition, icons regularly link the birth of Christ with his death and resurrection. The cave casts a shadow of suffering on this story by reminding the person who is praying in front of this icon that Jesus will be buried in a cave. He will rise from the cave and that the women who come to the tomb will be confronted only by linen cloths. Then the icon introduces us to Joseph. The angel appears to Joseph in his dreams with the words, Be not afraid, and assures him that the child conceived in Mary's womb is from the Holy Spirit. This child is the Emmanuel, God with us, which prepares us, the readers, for the promise of the risen Christ at the end of this gospel, that he will be with his disciples always to the end of time. Can you see the link between this and the rest of the gospel? And Joseph is to name the child Jesus, which means he who will save his people, but not just from the Roman invaders, but from all sin, the sins of oppression, violence, war, pride, arrogance, they all stem from the sin in the heart of human beings. The other scenes in this icon portray one, the bathing of the child Jesus. Two, the shepherds awakened by the angel with joyful greeting, taken from the Gospel of Luke. And three, the temptation of Joseph from the Proto-Gospel of James. Even though the temptation of Joseph by a stranger, the devil, is not explicitly mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, he made three very important points. One, Joseph's confusion, embarrassment, and even possible disgrace about the fact that Mary, his betrothed, is with child. Two, Joseph's sensitivity about not wanting to embarrass her betrothed Mary. Three, Joseph's humility and obedience to God's will. Then the Gospel of Matthew presents to us the story of the three wise men. In the icon we see them there at the top left hand corner. They are pointing to the star and following the star leading them. Below we see the three wise men worshipping the child as their king and bringing the child gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. With these three gifts the three wise men proclaim that this child is king, gold, priest, frankincense and prophet, myrrh. But these three gifts also introduce us to the shadow of suffering and death in the story. Finally, the three wise men do not return to Herod, as requested, but they are leaving, returning to their home, but transformed, changed. The icon shows them to us, looking backwards, looking to the star that had guided them. Their lives has now been changed because of the encounter with this child. But the birth of this child signals danger and threat to the power of Herod. His evil heart plans to destroy any possible contender to his rule. And so the angel visits Joseph once again in another dream and tells him that the child is in danger and he must take flight into Egypt. And the obedient Joseph starts this dangerous, treacherous journey accompanied by the angel. Having consulted with the wise men, Herod wickedly makes use of their information to hatch his evil plan. Herod orders the slaughter of all innocent children in his kingdom. 
The shadow of death prefigured by the cave and by the gifts of the wise men has now become the reality of death. The slaughtered innocent not only prefigure the death of Christ himself, but also the death of all the martyrs who will die and are still dying today as witnesses of Christ. Notice in the icon the contrast between Joseph and Herod. Joseph the just one, the obedient one, the faithful one. Herod determined to have his way against God's plan, against God's will. Notice also the contrast between Jesus and Herod. Jesus will save his people, Herod who is prepared to slaughter innocent children. Notice also the contrast between Herod's hatred and the grieving mothers crying for their beloved children. But the wickedness of Herod is emphasized with two more episodes from the Proto-Gospel of James. Having realized that the child has escaped, Herod then orders one of his soldiers to look for John. Elizabeth took her child up in the mountains in an attempt to hide him. The mountain moved, but the woman's grief opened and hid her and her child, causing her and her child to become invisible to the soldier. The second legend in the bottom right depicts the death of Zacharias, murdered at the altar because he would not reveal the hero soldiers where his son John was hidden. They are just two legends, but they are two full messages is loud and clear. The human heart is capable of incredible and unimaginable depths of evil. But the two legends also powerfully proclaim and foretell that God's plan is not going to be thwarted. Goodness will triumph over evil. After the death of Herod, the angels appears to Joseph in another dream to tell him that it is now safe to bring the child Jesus back, but not to Bethlehem, but to Nazareth, where Jesus will grow up in the house of Joseph and Mary. God did not entrust his son to be fathered in inverted commas by a rabbi or a scribe or a Pharisee or a rich merchant, but by Joseph and Mary. Joseph, a man who put God's agenda for Mary, his betrothed, before his own hopes. A man who left his home, Bethlehem, for the sake of the girl he loved and for the sake of the God he loved. A man who risked Herod's murderous intent and was ready to lay down his life for his bride, just as his son, Jesus, would be ready to lay down his life for his bride, the church. Joseph is Jesus' link to the great figures of the Old Testament. Moses, Joseph of the multicolored dream coat and the great King David. Joseph prefigures the role and mission of the church as the protector and the continuation of Jesus' ministry and mission to the world. But most of all, Joseph is the model and pattern for each one of us today, reminding us of the type of commitment and response that we should give to Jesus. There are no prophetic songs coming from Joseph's heart to his lips. In fact, the Bible recalls not a single word of his and he slips out of the story without even a sentence to mark his passing. In an era where we like our heroes to be articulate, powerful, sparkling, Joseph offers us a different model of discipleship. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph is described as a good man, a faithful man, a just man, an obedient man. He truly is the silent and the unsung hero who gave his life for Christ, the cornerstone of the church, and for Mary, the mother of the church. And so let us conclude with this prayer. God our Father, who from the family of your servant David raised up Joseph the carpenter to be the guardian of your incarnate son, 
and the husband of the Blessed Virgin Mary, give us the Christ to follow him in faithful obedience to your commands. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.